Erev Tov. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is, uh, by now, nearly 25 years that we have been holding the Carter Lectures uh, at Tel Aviv University, relating it one way or another to uh, the Middle East uh, peace process and what is left of it. Uh, today we have uh, the unique uh, pleasure and privilege uh, to have Dr. Khalil Shkaki uh, with us. I'm sure, as you all know, Khalil Shkaki is one of the most renowned Palestinian political scientists, one of the most astute observers of Palestinian politics. And it is indeed a great uh, pleasure and privilege to have him here uh, with us. Dr. Shkaki is an associate professor of political science, director of the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in Ramallah, and a senior fellow at the Crown Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Brandeis University. He earned his PhD from Columbia uh, in 1985, has taught at various universities in the West Bank and in the United States, has been a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and his assessments are sought worldwide. The topic of uh, Dr. Shkaki's uh, presentation this evening will be the Hamas victory, the future of the Palestinian Authority, and Israeli-Palestinian relations. So without further ado, Dr. Shkaki, please. Thank you, Asha. I certainly didn't expect to be speaking here. At <clears throat> I, I was saying I did not expect to be speaking here about a Hamas victory. I, certainly not before the election, so I must start by admitting that I, my own uh, speculation about the outcome of elections were wrong, uh, even though I have the tools um, to be in a much better position than many people to know about what people might or might not do in the day of elections. Nonetheless, I expected Hamas to lose by a narrow margin and Fadah to win by a narrow margin. So the question that I, one of the questions that I will start with is why did Fadah and the Palestinian Authority decide to go to elections knowing that there was a certain risk of losing these elections? I must say um, people did expect at one point or another that, 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 that there was a possibility that Hamas will win. It wasn't like that everybody expected Hamas to lose and, and that, that made the decision to go to elections easy. There was a possibility that Hamas could, in fact, uh, win the elections. The question, therefore, is why did we go to elections knowing that this was a distinct possibility? <clears throat> the second question that I will try to answer is why did Hamas win? After all, most of us did not expect it to win, so why did it win? <clears throat> and the third question that I will try to answer is, will Hamas succeed in taking control of the Palestinian Authority? Um, you, you would expect, of course, after elections that the winner would take control. Um, but there is a question mark about the ability of Hamas to take control over the Palestinian Authority and, and to succeed in, in, in taking control. So this is going to be the third question that I will raise and try to answer. Will Hamas succeed in taking control? I hope I'll give you a better answer than uh, that I gave before the elections about will Hamas win or lose. Um, the fourth question that I will try to answer is what options, what, what options does Hamas uh, have in terms of its uh, ability to formulate a cabinet, a, a coalition, 
and to pursue a policy that might succeed. What options it has, what options Fatah has in terms of dealing with this, and what options the international community, perhaps including Israel, uh, has as well, or have as well. And finally, what are the risks and the advantages of, of whatever options the Fatah and the international community, including Israel, might uh, or might not pursue. So these, I believe, were about five questions that I hope to be able to answer in the next 50 minutes or so. <laughs> Why did we go to elections? It should, I mean, if, if we were, if we are now standing a year from today, we would be asking why isn't Abu Mazen and the Palestinian Authority doing things? And the answer I would give is they feel lack of legitimacy, that the Palestinian political system lacks legitimacy in the eyes of the public, and that is constraining the hands of the Palestinian Authority, that the only way that the Palestinian Authority will be able to take tough decisions, decisions that are related to to enforcing law and order, uh, on the one hand, domestically, two issues related to enforcing an Israeli-Palestinian ceasefire. That the ability to do so depends on the ability of the Palestinian Authority to gain legitimacy from the public. And that the only way to do so would be to go to elections. So the question, therefore, before, before us a year ago was, how can we transform a paralyzed Palestinian Authority into a, a, an authority that is able to function. And the, question, and, and the only answer that was possible, feasible at that time, was to give that authority legitimacy. And the only way to do it was to open up the political system, to make it more inclusive. And that meant to invite Hamas into the political process. There was another reason why we needed to go to elections. The only way to avoid a civil war and at the same time be able to reach a ceasefire agreement with Israel, that is a ceasefire that is enforceable, was to reach an agreement with Hamas on the ceasefire. And therefore, the Cairo Declaration about a year ago, on the 17th of March, 2005, was essentially the outcome of this thinking. In order for the Palestinian Authority to be able, in order for Abu Mazen to be able to govern or to start to govern, to start to deal with the problems of the Palestinian Authority, he needed a ceasefire in place. And he couldn't do it by force because that meant civil war. So he needed one by agreement, one in which Hamas would agree to. So the dialogue that has been going on in Cairo for more than a year uh, at that time, a year and a half in fact, at that time, was going nowhere. Now there was an opportunity, actually two years and a half, not a year and a half. Um, now there was an opportunity, in the aftermath of Arafat's death, perhaps to reach some sort of understanding on the ceasefire if the promise of inclusion in the political system was real. Hamas was always promised uh, uh, inclusion in the political system. It never believed it. Arafat created a highly authoritarian political system. Inclusion was meaningless in that kind of political system. But now without Arafat in the picture, Hamas calculated that inclusion actually meant something that there was an alternative available to Hamas to be able to influence public policy. And that alternative was the political process, being in, included in that political process. So Hamas was now willing to engage the Palestinian Authority in, that, in a fruitful dialogue. And it was therefore willing to give the Palestinian Authority the ceasefire or the tahdiyah that Abu Mazen was asking for. But, in order for that agreement 
to be reached, Abu Mazen needed to give Hamas in writing what Hamas wanted. And so the Cairo Declaration was actually a six-point declaration. It wasn't a single-point declaration. This was not about ceasefire period. This was about six different issues. And one of those issues was the elections. One of those issues, in fact, was not only just the elections and the agreement on holding the elections as the means to affirm to Hamas its inclusion in the political process, but also an agreement on what kind of electoral system will be used for those elections. And hence the agreement on the 50-50 mixed system. 50% of the members of the parliament would be elected by proportional representation. The other 50% would be elected in districts by a majority system. This was the price that the Palestinian Authority was willing to pay to Hamas in order for Hamas to agree to the ceasefire. Without this price being paid, we should not delude ourselves about our ability to have had a ceasefire during the last year. That ceasefire was only, whatever we call a ceasefire, was only possible because of that Cairo Declaration, and that Cairo Declaration was only possible as long as it included the election date and the electoral system to which Hamas agreed. So this was a political framework that allowed the two processes to proceed, the state building process with the elections and the electoral, new electoral system and the peace process. Abu Mazen was given an opportunity to pursue a peace process. The fact that Israel, the United States, and the Palestinian Authority failed to make anything out of it isn't Hamas's fault. Hamas gave us a ceasefire, and it was committed to it. Certainly other groups were not as committed as Hamas was, but Hamas did indeed commit itself to a ceasefire and did its best to abide by it. There were a few exceptions, but overall, Hamas was very successful in observing its commitments. That's why we went to elections, therefore. It was unavoidable. Because the alternative was civil war, and the alternative was or a paralyzed Palestinian Authority. And both were unacceptable. And the risks, therefore, including the risk that Hamas would win, were considered relatively moderate risks, not very high risks. One month before the elections, the top Palestinian decision maker, the president, knew that given the fragmentation within Farah, given the existing strength of, of Hamas, there, is, there was a distinct possibility that if this continues, that Hamas could actually win, and could actually win a significant majority. This was not only something that the Palestinian president knew about. This is also something that the Americans were aware of. So, again, nobody expected that things will actually remain the same. A month before the elections, there was tremendous fragmentation within Fatah, if you recall. Fatah actually was split into two groups. Had that split continued, the, the magnitude of Hamas's victory would have been even much greater than what we have seen. Although the major split was dealt with, the smaller splits, the, the smaller or the, 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 the existing fragmentation from before the split were so great that it was very clear that if they were left undealt with, that, that is the, the impact on the voting in the districts could potentially be disastrous. So why did Hamas win? Well, I've already talked about the fragmentation, but I'll come to it in a minute. But before that, let me say in the more systemic way that I believe 
there were essentially uh, three reasons why Hamas won the elections. And I distinguish between winning the elections and the magnitude of the win. The magnitude of the win is essentially the nature of the electoral system, which I'll explain in a minute, and the fragmentation within Farah. That's certainly one reason why the magnitude was so uh, unexpected. Um, but the fact that Hamas, in fact, did win the popular vote, not a majority of the popular vote, but it did win 44% of the popular vote. Farah won 41.5% of the popular vote. Put together, the secular nationalist forces won 56% of the popular vote. But this 44% for Hamas was not expected. It did happen, and we need to find an explanation for it. Here are mine. The greatest asset for Farah was certainly not its ability to govern. This was lousy, and Farah recognized it, the public recognized it, everybody recognized it. It was lousy governance, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But the greatest asset was its ability to reach a peace agreement with Israel. The whole Oslo process was predicated on Farah transforming itself into a Palestinian state in being, into the government, of the, into the, 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 the the ruling part of the Palestinian Authority. And the peace process, by the time we went to elections, in the eyes of the majority of the Palestinians, was dead. Only 9% of the voters, 9%, considered the peace process to be an important, or the, not an important, but the most important consideration in their voting. Of those, of course, of those who did indeed consider the peace process to be the most important consideration, the overwhelming majority did vote for Farah. More than 70% of those actually voted for Farah. And only 19% voted for Hamas. So the public is fully aware of the fact that Hamas cannot lead to a successful peace process. and that only Fatah can lead to a successful peace process, a process that is based on diplomacy, not violence. Fatah, therefore, on the day of elections, was deprived of its greatest asset, the only remaining asset it had by now, therefore, becomes irrelevant. The second issue is violence, or the role of violence perceived by the public. The way the public viewed violence. For a long time, violence was perceived before the peace process, was perceived by the public as the only means to end the occupation. Then we saw great transformation within the PLO where diplomacy becomes an important instrument in ending the occupation, and by the time we go to Oslo, in fact, diplomacy becomes the only means of ending occupation. Some, of course, believe that, uh, that the Farah and the PLO were not serious about it. I'm not talking about Farah and the PLO leadership. I'm talking about the public, public opinion. By mid-90s, by the time we had Oslo, reached the conclusion that violence does not pay. If you recall the February and March suicide attacks in Tel Aviv and, and Jerusalem back in 1996, February and March of 1996, these were the tax, test cases for the public. Will the public support or oppose these attacks? Because at that time, if you recall, this was just a few weeks, a few months after the uh, army would draw from the uh, parts of the Gaza Strip and the, West, and the cities in the West Bank, m most of the cities of the West Bank. This is the time right after the elections in January of that year. So the two processes of state building and peace process were more or less moving forward. And here comes the suicide attacks. And how many people supported them? 18 to 20 percent. 
That's how much support there was for these attacks. Relatively speaking, this means only a small minority of Palestinians still believed that violence pays. The overwhelming majority believed, I would say about 80 percent at that time, did not believe in violence. Throughout this period, even after Netanyahu became the Israeli Prime Minister, we, when we asked the question, do you think if Palestinians resort to violence or armed confrontations, is the term we used, if Palestinians resorted to armed confrontations with Israel, that this would help Palestinians gain more rights? The answer was no. The overwhelming majority told us no. This was not the way to go. By the, by the end of Netanyahu's period, we begin to see a little bit more than 20% supporting violence. I, I believe by then we reached 40, 45%. But still the majority was still opposed to return to violence. Majority of Palestinians believed in diplomacy. And when the Intifada erupted, uh, by the way, we, the first time we saw a majority in support for resort to violence uh, since the mid-90s, was right after Camp David. In, in July 2000, when Arafat and Barak returned from Camp David, we did a survey among the Palestinians in which for the first time ever, more than 50% said, if Palestinians today resort to armed confrontations, uh, this would be the means of achieving Palestinian national rights. This would be more effective in helping Palestinians achieve national rights. Then came the Intifada, few months later, and the level of support for violence skyrocketed to 70, 80 percent. But the reason it skyrocketed was not because Palestinians all of a sudden discovered the virtue of violence. It was because Palestinians were angry. It was because the Palestinian threat perception was such uh, reached such high proportions that people wanted revenge. So the rise in the level of support for violence in the 2002, 2003, 2004 was essentially that kind of emotional reaction to threat perception. Then comes the disengagement, unilateral disengagement, which I believe changed public perception. So violence and the role of violence changed from a not helpful to helpful as an instrument of policy. This engagement, unilateral disengagement, affirmed in public mind that violence can be an effective instrument of policy. Politics by other means. This is what unilateralism meant for Palestinians. With 84% on the eve of disengagement, 84% of the public believing that the disengagement was victory for violence, that Israel is running under fire. So, what is the meaning of all of this for the elections? The meaning is, at that time, the level of support for violence, on the, as when we went to elections, the level of support for violence was not at its lowest, but in fact it was low. Now, the, the contradiction between, on the one hand, appreciating the value of violence at the rational level and refusing to support violence is, is something that I can get into in the discussion if, if you wish. But by the end of 2005, we had these two different uh, attitudes of the public. On the one hand, there is a growing opposition to violence created by this engagement. This engagement essentially changed public priorities, led people to want better economic conditions, better state building, less violence. And at the same time, this engagement also created the conviction that violence pays. So there, is, there was no demand for violence, 
but there is an appreciation of the role of violence. So Hamas and Hamas's call for violence was not seen as necessarily bad, since Hamas's own election platform did not call for violence. In fact, Hamas was deliberately hiding its position on violence during the election campaign. Yes, it did talk about the legitimacy of resistance, so did Farah. In fact, Marwan Barghouti was more outright and, and straightforward in <clears throat> talking about violence than Hamas. Hamas's belief, belief, belief in violence, therefore, did not hurt Hamas on the day of elections. <clears throat> The third reason that Hamas won, and I believe this is the most dramatic, is because state-building issues, most importantly, issues of corruption and safety and security of, uh, at a personal level, became the paramount issues, the top most important issues for the public. <clears throat> Those who on the day of elections, the overwhelming majority of Palestinians believed that the PA is corrupt. 87%. That's the overwhelming majority. 75% of the public said they personally and their families do not feel safe and secure in their homes. That's on the day of elections. So we're talking about three quarters or more of the public feeling on these two critical issues. I say critical because on the day of elections, that's what the public told us. The top most important consideration in voting was corruption. Who was more able to deal with corruption? And the answer to this question was always Hamas. We knew that before. On the day of elections, 71% who said corruption was the most important consideration voted for Hamas. 19% voted for Farah. Of those who said they, feel not, they do not feel secure and safe in their home, 56% voted for Hamas. 30% or so voted for Farah. The two most important issues that gained prominence, so much prominence on the day of elections, Hamas was doing well on these two issues. And on the only issue, of course, in which Farah, as it started with, was doing well, which is the peace process, that issue was at the bottom of considerations and priorities. This, I believe, is why Hamas won. Because people wanted Hamas to lead the process of state building and reform in the Palestinian Authority. It wasn't that people were just angry with Farah because of corruption. They were. It wasn't that they were angry with Farah and Abu Mazen and everybody for the lack of progress in the peace process. They were. But they couldn't have voted for anybody else other than Farah. The reason they have voted for Hamas, not any other faction out of the other nine factions, there were 11 factions in these elections running. The reason people voted for Hamas and not any one of the others is because they were not interested in hurting Farah. People wanted to defeat Farah and the only way they could defeat Farah was to turn to Hamas. That's one reason. The second reason is because people actually believe that Hamas can deliver on the critical issue of who can reform the Palestinian Authority, the overwhelming majority said Hamas, not Farah. On the issue of who can deliver safety and security, which in fact in our surveys throughout the year before, Farah was winning. All of a sudden, Hamas won on the day of elections the answer to the question who can deliver safety and security. The majority said Hamas and not Farah. Why did this happen? Why, why the, the last minute change? If you look at what was happening within the Palestinian Authority just one month before the elections, you can understand why. There was, in some cases, a total uh, collapse of law and order, particularly in the Gaza Strip. There were question marks, as you, some of you must recall, uh, whether elections will take place. The interior minister said, I can't guarantee security for the elections. So wh why was this, all of this happening? Why was this an issue? It's because Farah or elements within Farah did not want elections to take place. It was because a lot of militias, warlords, didn't want elections to happen. 
<clears throat> they also had some other reasons. Some wanted to be put in the payroll. The collapse of law and order, therefore, was a fetah business. Fetah was responsible for the collapse of law and order in the weeks and months leading up to the elections. If Fetah is responsible for the collapse of law and order, how could we expect people who wanted law and order to vote again for Fetah? Question now is why was it <clears throat> so bad? Um, let me just dispel the notion or that this was a vote for Hamas's religious orientation. I said it's for Hamas's ability to deliver better governance, but not for Hamas's socio-religious program. Religiosity was somewhat important, but it, was not, it did not determine the outcome of the elections. Um, to a large extent, the majority of the Palestinians, as of course as the elections indicate, one voted for secular nationalist groups, not for Hamas. But even if we look at those who voted for Hamas, we can find that a sizable minority, a uh, sizable minority in fact is 48%, 48% of those who voted for Hamas identified themselves as not being religious. That tells me that the vote was not based on religiosity. Although, again, 52% of those who identify themselves, of those who voted for Hamas, did identify themselves as religious. So, if it was 44%, why did Hamas end up with uh, more than almost 60% of the seats? About 59% if we were to... Um, include the independents, four independents that, uh, that Hamas supported. The electoral system, a majority system, allowed the, one, the, the, the candidate with the largest number of seats, regardless of the percentage of that, uh, uh, the largest number of votes, regardless of, of the percentage of the vote, to, uh, uh, to win that seat. Hamas, looking at all the, um, the, the votes for its candidates in the districts, won an average of about 41%. We were to take all the seats that were given to, uh, to Hamas. Hamas won 41% of the voters in the districts. Farah won uh, 34%. And the independents or the other factions put together one, 25% of the seats, of the votes, I'm sorry. What does that tell us? It tells us that Hamas did, in fact, poorly in the districts. But, even with that, it won 45 seats out of the 66. Why? Because for every Hamas candidate, there were six non-Hamas candidates. The ratio of six to one in a majority system is, of course, crazy for anyone organizing elections. In, in the case of Farah, the ratio was three to four, three and a half Farah candidates for every Hamas candidate. Uh, most of Farah candidates ran as independent, well, all of them, other than the official uh, 66 candidates, ran as independents. <clears throat> of those independents, 78 candidates were actually senior official Farah members. Had those officials not been on the ballot, so the ratio could have been four and a half to one, it would be Farah that would be forming the cabinet and the coalition today, not Hamas. Had Farah been able to convince its own senior officials, not to, the 78 senior officials, not, I'm not talking about all the 120 or 150 Farah uh, candidates, just the 78 senior officials, some of them members of Farah Revolutionary Council, had they been out of the race, it would be Farah that would be forming the 
cabinet today. Farah would have won more seats than Hamas. One or two seats more than Hamas. And it would certainly have been able to form a coalition with other groups. <clears throat> Had Farah been better equipped to understand the logic, uh, well, I'm sure they understood the logic, but were able to deal with it more effectively in terms of forging alliances before the elections. In a majority system, you forge alliances before, not after. In your system, <clears throat> you forge alliances after elections, not before. As a proportional representation system, you wait until you, you know the size of the other side, and, and then you, you, you go to them to talk about coalitions. In a majority system, you do that before you go to elections, not after. Farah did not do that. So, all these other factions that were running, other than Farah and Hamas, actually lost. Even lost, they did not win a single seat in the districts, even though they had 25% of the vote. So, had Abu Mazen and Farah been clever, and forged alliances with just the PLO. If they said all the PLO will run in one single ticket in the districts, you know how many seats Fatah Hamas would have won in the districts? Instead of 45, Hamas would have won five. Not 45, five. That's how many seats Hamas won by more than 50%. Therefore, the magnitude of victory for Hamas, of course we're not, we're not uh, uh, unique in this. If you, if you look at the uh, Turkish election in, in 2002, <coughs> the, the uh, AKP won one-third of the popular vote and two-thirds of the seats. Uh, the Republican Party won one-fifth of the uh, popular vote and one-third of the seats. Although, in that case, of course, it was the threshold. In the Turkish case, the threshold was 10%. In our case, it was not the threshold. The threshold was just 2%, so this was not the reason for it. But it was essentially the fragmentation within Farah and the lack of insight on the part of Farah to forge coalitions before the elections with the, fact, with the other factions that led to such a magnificent defeat. Uh, so what will happen now? Will Hamas succeed in gaining control? Difficult to say. I've learned not to make far-reaching conclusions. Why, why difficult to say? They've won the elections. Well, difficult to say because even though they have won the elections, they are not the only actor in the Palestinian Authority. There are other actors who have a great deal of power. Let me give you some examples. First of all, we have the president. He has a great deal of power. Second of all, I assure you, I I assure you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer right now. I'm, I'm, right now. The president is number one. He is a very important actor because he can dismiss the cabinet. He's the one who can select the prime minister. He can create total paralysis in the Palestinian Authority whenever he wishes to, and he has operational capacity, control over many of the agencies and many of the senior bureaucrats. Second, we have the security services. Well, normally the security services are under the control of the cabinet. Well, that's in your system, not in ours. In ours, there are question marks about who controls what services. 80%, 82% of the security services voting on the day of elections voted for Farah. They did so because they are card-holding members of Farah. 
the overwhelming majority of the members of the security services, we're talking about 70,000 people in the security services, are loyal to Farah, will remain loyal to Farah, not Hamas, even though they might nominally come under, or some of them, under the control of the cabinet, they are still an independent actor in the political system. The third actor is the bureaucracy. We have another 70,000 people in the public sector. The most senior officials in the bureaucracy, everywhere in the bureaucracy, are again Fatah loyalists. Any attempt by Hamas to dismiss them will most likely be confronted by violence from Fatah. So it is not easy for Hamas to dismiss any of those people. Thirdly, fourthly, we have the judiciary. Well, if you have heard, well, today, the, uh, some of you might have heard, Fatah walked out of the, uh, of the first parliament meeting. One reason, of course, why is because Fatah wants to show that Hamas cannot even run the parliament, in which Hamas has the overwhelming majority. But underneath all of this, of course, is Farah's belief that if there is a disagreement with Hamas on how to move forward on any issue, the referee is not the vote. The referee is the constitutional court. What does this mean? Well, it means Farah isn't worried about the vote. In fact, since the starting of, since the elections, there has been two sessions of the parliament in both cases, Fatah did not participate in the vote at all. There were votes in which essentially Fatah boycotted the vote, unofficially, but it was a boycott. Fatah therefore intends to rely on the courts to settle differences with Hamas, not on votes. Well, can, can they... Can... Can, the question is, can Fatah get away with it? And can, in fact, the judiciary become another independent actor in the system used by Fatah against Hamas? The answer is not clear, but yes, it is possible. If the uh, president gets away with the uh, changes he introduced uh, into the law regarding the constitutional court, yes. Indeed, he will be able, and Fatah will be able to control the judiciary and therefore settle differences this way with Hamas. Finally, there are the non-PA actors. We have non-state actors, or semi-state actors. We have two semi-state actors outside, within the PA, but outside of the PA governance. The militias, and Fatah has a huge militia, and the PLO. The PLO is under the control of Farah. The chairman of the PLO is Abu Mazen, the president. And given the unresolved conflict with Israel, Hamas cannot, under the present conditions, dissolve the militias. That means Farah, in fact, has a huge militia which it can use to paralyze the whole West Bank and Gaza, anytime it wants to, it certainly can paralyze the parliament if they want to. These are all actors outside the system, outside the system that is controlled by Hamas. Therefore, it is fair to ask the question, will Hamas be able to control the Palestinian Authority? But there are other reasons why Hamas might not be able to control the Palestinian Authority. We have 150,000 people in the public sector we need $120 million every month to pay for the public sector. Of those, only $30 million come from sources, pure Palestinian sources, that is, my taxes and other Palestinian taxes, just $30 million. And that's given today's reality, of course. If things deteriorate tomorrow, the ability of the Palestinian Authority to collect the $30 million would diminish considerably. So hundred, that, that leaves $90,000 million dollars to come from outside sources. From Israel, about $55 million every month comes uh, in transfers of revenues that Israel collects on behalf of the Palestinian Authority. <clears throat> so Israel controls that. 
And the rest comes from the international community, including Arab countries, but it's outside sources. So in terms of control over money, Hamas does not have guaranteed sources of funding as the case was or could have been <clears throat> for Farah. The ability to deliver services, this is one of the services to pay the public sector. But the ability to deliver law and order, given the situation I described, the militias and all that. The ability to deliver social services, given the control over the bureaucracy. Uh, the ability to deliver justice in the justice system, again, given the control of FEDA. And certainly the ability to deliver progress, progress, even as little as removing a single checkpoint, is also not under Hamas's control. So, will Hamas succeed, despite all of this, in taking control of the PA? Hamas has three options in doing so. That gets me into my fourth topic. It can decide to do so on its own. That is, to form a Hamas cabinet and to use its own resources, go to Iran, um, go to the Gulf, uh, use force if necessary against Farah, risk civil war, etc., etc., etc. This is one option, a Hamas way. Do it Hamas way. Prime minister from Hamas, ministers from Hamas, etc. <clears throat> At the moment, this seems to be uh, the least liked option for Hamas. Hamas does not want to go that way. The second is to forge a coalition with Farah, in which case Farah would help Hamas take control. It would mean that perhaps the prime minister would not be from Hamas. It would mean probably the prime minister would be Salam Fayyad, for example, who would be Farah's candidate for prime minister in this case. It would mean that the interior minister, the foreign minister, and even the finance minister would not come from Hamas. It means that <clears throat> the, f the platform of the cabinet is going to be absolutely in line with what the president wants the platform to be. The president basically said it must be the PLO platform. It must mean recognition of Israel, it must mean uh, recognition of Oslo, etc., etc., and the roadmap. <clears throat> the third option for Hamas is to go Abu Mazen's way. Uh, I believe the second, go Abu Mazen's way means essentially that it, Hamas will defer to Abu Mazen, to the president. So he will be the one who will make who will be the referee, who will make the tough decisions. In this case, the cabinet would be more of a cabinet of bureaucrats uh, rather than of politicians from Hamas. Even if the prime minister comes from Hamas, um, the, the, most of the ministries in our system, the prime minister, by the way, does not have much of a function other than to chair the sessions. Ministries do the work. Ministers do the work, not the prime minister. Of the three options that Hamas has, I believe Hamas prefers the second one, that is to form a coalition with Farah, even if that entails having to agree to the things they said Hamas would have to agree to. Would Hamas agree to the roadmap, recognition of Israel? Not Hamas, but the PA, yes. My answer is yes, Hamas would probably agree to a cabinet that does not have a Hamas prime minister, certainly insists that it does not have a Farah prime minister, but it could agree to a, Hama, to a cabinet without Hamas prime minister, and it would agree to the platform that the president wants. But Hamas itself would not agree to that platform. It would agree that this would be the platform of the Palestinian Authority. Now, Hamas would still have a majority in the, in the uh, parliament. It can bring down the cabinet any time it wants to. But I believe Hamas would not, if it accepts this arrangement, would not go that far except in strategic matters if it feels that the decision made by the cabinet uh, 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 and the prime minister, who would not be from Hamas, uh, have gone too far. In this case, Hamas might risk uh, bringing down the cabinet and the coalition. What are the options for Farah? Farah essentially has two options. It 
option number one is to uh, do what Fatah is doing now, essentially uh, force Hamas to fail. This is also the preferred option uh, by the international community and Israel. It's a uh, motivated by the calculations I've made earlier. Remember those calculations about Hamas winning now only five seats in the districts? They're very seductive, aren't they? That's what is driving Fatah today, going back to elections as soon as possible. Better alliances, better cohesion, deal with fragmentation. If you buy it, if you, if you believe Fatah will behave differently in the next elections, this is a very uh, seductive approach to the, to the issues. Fatah at the moment seems to be going that way. The second alternative to Farah is to try and help Abu Mazen. That is, to take the position that it will judge Hamas based on what it does. It will not help it, it will not join the coalition, because this seems to be totally excluded at the moment by Farah. But the alternative is to help Abu Mazen govern. And to help Abu Mazen govern means Farah cannot be very destructive to Hamas's ability to govern. That would be an option that Fatah could take. That is, in order to ensure that Abu Mazen remains in office, Fatah knows that if, if Abu Mazen feels fed up with pressure from Israel, the international community on the one hand, and pressure from Hamas on the other, Abu Mazen will probably resign. His um, uh, denial of, of intention to resign notwithstanding, I think Abu Mazen will definitely resign if he finds that he is not able to effectively lead uh, in the way he wants and that Hamas or that nobody is leading. And I believe one of the options of Fatah, therefore, is to ensure that uh, there is sufficient progress that would allow Abu Mazen to remain, in, to remain president, waiting for the next elections. What are the risks in Farah's first option? This is also, as I said, Israel's option, by the way. This is also the option of the international, or the, the U.S. at least. The international community has this option, that is to force Hamas to fail. It has another option, which is essentially to wait and see, judge Hamas by its action. It has the third option of actually helping Hamas to govern by encouraging Farah to join the coalition. So the international community has three options. At the moment, Israel, the Nazis, and Farah are pushing for the first one, which is force Hamas to fail. What are the risks of this? <clears throat> there are six risks, I believe, of going this way. Number one, it will probably make Hamas stronger. Hamas won 44%. If we go to elections six months from today, after we implement this strategy, in my view, Hamas will win a majority of the popular vote. If and when the Palestinians see that Hamas is being forced to lose or to fail, not to lose, to fail, public support will significantly increase for Hamas. More public support at a time when in fact Hamas will probably become more radical. It would be forced by then to rely on Iran and other uh, extremist regional powers. And that, I believe, will probably radicalize Hamas further. The second problem or risk involved in, in the strategy, it means that there will be no significant reforms in the Palestinian Authority. It will continue to have the militias. Hamas will probably try to uh, impose some of its own social agenda. The whole question of is democracy good for the region, I think, will be uh, viewed in very nightmarish uh, scenarios. The third, reason, the third risk that we take 
is that Hamas's response is going to be in, 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 in violent clashes. There will be an escalation in violence if, we, if Hamas begins to see that it is being forced to fail. The fourth is that very soon the PA will indeed collapse. And if the PA collapses, there will be, there will be no ifs or buts about it, there will be a humanitarian disaster in the Palestinian areas. The fifth reason is why we take a great deal of risk in going this way is that even if Israel decides to go unilateral again and wants to carry out this engagement, the situation in the West Bank will be such that such disengagement will be impossible to carry out physically. And of course, there will be no chance for any negotiations under this scenario. Finally, Abu Mazen will definitely resign, I believe, in a few months after we start implementing this strategy. So what, 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 is, what is there to do? I believe the best strategy is actually help Hamas govern form a national unity government, encourage Farah to join the cabinet with Hamas. What are the benefits of, of going this way? Well, first of all, it means the peace process is not totally ended. It means Abu Mazen and Farah and the government will be able to coordinate the next Israeli disengagement if Israel decides to go this way. Second, under this scenario, it will be possible for Abu Mazen and the next Israeli Prime Minister to conduct, if they wish, secret permanent status negotiations. It could, in my view, if it succeeds, there will be a majority of Palestinians uh, to support it. And I believe looking at Palestinian attitudes regarding compromises of permanent status, that the trend in Palestinian attitudes over the last decade has been towards moderation and that for the first time in a long time, we have now a majority of Palestinians and Israelis that is willing to support the basic compromises of a permanent status agreement. It will only be possible to go that way, I believe, if there is a national unity government. Thirdly, the only way that democracy will work in this region is if we are able to moderate the views of the Islamists and other radical groups Make no mistakes about it. If there are any elections in the Arab world, the Islamists will win. Not because people love the Islamists, but because they are the most effective opposition. We have created authoritarian regimes in the Arab world that have essentially decapitated all kinds of opposition groups. There are no secular nationalist opposition groups to take over from oppressive regimes in the Arab world. Islamists, however, control the institutions of religion in the Arab world, and they have the captive audience of the mosques, they can and will, in my view, win elections when almost no one else can. We have to deal with this reality by integrating those people and helping them to moderate their views, not radicalize them further. And the only way we will be able to moderate Hamas's views is if we are able to provide that moderation with a Palestinian context. The Palestinian context in this case would be Hamas willing to accept a national unity government in which Farah is able to implement the President's program with regard to the peace process. I believe Hamas will only accept this, which will be a sign of moderation if there is a national unity government. Now, I believe by to, 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 to the answer, the answer to the question is Hamas reformable. Can, can Hamas moderate? Is, it depends on the context. If there is a Palestinian context, then I believe it will moderate. We have already provided one, the Cairo Declaration. The Cairo Declaration meant that on the one hand, Hamas now accepts the legitimacy of the political order. In the past, Hamas said it was not recognized legitimacy. It refused to recognize the Palestinian Authority now recognizes the legitimacy of the political order. It is willing to uh, accede to decisions made by this political order. And I think this is the first sign of moderation on the part of, of an Islamist movement. We need to encourage this moderation by providing a context that will make it 
uh, move faster, and it will make it easier for the Palestinian Islamists and other Islamists, I believe, in the region to moderate their views without being seen as uh, buckling under Israeli or American pressure. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Khalil, for that uh, very comprehensive uh, analytical expose, the likes of which uh, we may like or dislike uh, here or there, but the likes of which we ha certainly have not heard uh, in the university until now, and for that we thank you very much indeed. Uh, Khalil has agreed to uh, take uh, some questions if there are. Uh, it would be best if those who want to ask questions come down to the mics on, in the aisles so that people can hear what you're saying. Uh, yes, sir. We'll take a few questions and then we can reply. Yes, sir. And the EU. The EU. Yeah. The roadmap involves dealing between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The Islamic only Hamas reject speaking to the Israelis, everybody else but the Israelis. How can we involve the roadmap? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for the explanation. It's very interesting. And I have two questions. Question number one, you pointed a very interesting uh, fact that uh, at the end of about 2000, after Camp David, the majority of the Palestinians turned into supporting uh, active resistance, and I would say, uh, radical resistance. Yes, what do you think was, if there is, and uh, was the impact of the retreat? Israel from Lebanon on this one. Okay. Question number two, do you think that the Sharon government purposefully was leading into the Hamas uh, win, whereby uh, Israel would be a free unilaterally to set up borders, probably with the Hamas uh, governing the <coughs> Yes, sir.
Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. I think we have enough for the first round. I, um, I do not believe uh, that Hamas will change its attitude with regard to the recognition of Israel or negotiations with Israel. I don't believe uh, this is going to happen under any of the, of the scenarios I've described. So the uh, even in, if there is a national unity government, which is highly unlikely, even though I, I do think it's the best way to go, um, the, it will be FADA and the president who will negotiate the roadmap and the implementation of the roadmap. I do believe that there is a very good chance that the roadmap will be implemented. Let me put it this way. The roadmap is much more implementable under a national unity government of this sort than it was before the elections. I, I, I think Hamas will agree to that, will agree to Abu Mazen negotiating uh, such a deal in the hope that uh, if he fails, it will be Israel's responsibility and uh, Israel's conditions that will make him fail, not Hamas, and that the Palestinians will see that and that it will only confirm in the minds of the Palestinians that negotiations uh, are not the, the way to go, that diplomacy isn't working. Um, but if negotiations were to succeed, I do not believe that Hamas uh, will prevent, in the national unity government context, uh, the implementation of any agreement that might be reached between the President, uh, Farah, and, and Israel and the Quartet on the implementation of the roadmap. There is a majority of Palestinians that support the implementation of the roadmap. Um, one third of Hamas supporters told us on the day of elections that they want the next uh, parliament to implement the roadmap. Um, one third of Hamas supporters, a majority of Palestinians, but one third of Hamas supporters included, supported a two-state solution whereby Palestinians would recognize the state of Israel as the state for the Jewish people, and Israel would recognize Palestine as the state for Palestinian people. Um, so there is no doubt that public opinion will also weigh in and influence Hamas's decision as to whether it will or will not allow a successful implementation of the roadmap. So I, I don't think it's going to be easy, but the implementation of the roadmap has not been easy so far as we know. Uh, and I don't believe if the roadmap implementation fails, it will fail within the context of national unity. It will fail because Hamas is making it impossible. To the contrary, I believe the largest and the most difficult issue uh, in the roadmap is the question of the collection of arms and the militia. And I believe the only way we can go about implementing this part of the roadmap is a national unity government in which both Farah and Hamas would dissolve their militias and perhaps the security services would be one place where all these services uh, with all these militias for a temporary period of time as part of a DDR process, demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration process um, would be implemented. <clears throat> so I, I do not believe we should ex wait for Hamas to be ready to negotiate. It, this will probably take a long time, 10, 20 years before Hamas, I believe, is ready to negotiate. But I believe Hamas is ready today to allow Abu Mazen and Farah to negotiate, including to negotiate the implementation of the roadmap. And this, I believe, is what we need to look for, and not to change Hamas's ideology or Hamas's behavior. As long as that behavior is not restricting the behavior or the ideology or the position of the PA and the PLO, then I, need, I, I believe we should be able to live with Hamas keeping whatever ideology it has. For Eventually, I believe it will change it, but I don't think this is going to happen uh, fast enough to rescue the roadmap. <clears throat> you are right, Abu Mazen did win a 63% uh, of the popular vote as president, um, but he inherited a parliament and a 
government um, that was perceived by the majority of the Palestinians as lacking legitimacy. Now, has Abu Mazen been a strong character? He might, despite that, went ahead and, and uh, enforced law and order and perhaps even went ahead and implemented the roadmap. But Abu Mazen is not that kind of character. He is a coalition builder. He's a man of vision. But he's not a leader. Certainly not a leader in tough situations like these. That's why I don't expect him to stay in office if things become tough, because he's not a tough leader. He will resign. His decision when he was elected was to wait until after the elections. He went to Cairo for the Cairo Declaration to bring Hamas into the picture because he didn't want to take the risk of going to civil war. And I believe, therefore, Abu Mazen perhaps was not the kind of, even though he did indeed have that kind of legitimacy, but he wasn't the kind of person, a character, a leader, uh, who would have acted under uh, these difficult conditions. Now, the public voted Farah out Hamas in because of state building, I believe. I believe the public believed Hamas has failed to deliver on both the peace process and state building. And it believed that Hamas can deliver at least on state building. That's why it voted Hamas in. Now, with regard to the peace process, as I said, what I believe was, was perhaps critical, perhaps not, but perhaps was critical, was the belief that violence pays. By the end of 2005, the public was overwhelmingly convinced that this engagement, unilateral disengagement, was the outcome of violence. And the plurality of the Palestinians gave Hamas, not Fatah, Hamas, their credit for forcing Israel to pull out from Gaza. So the risk the public was taking by supporting Hamas to lead, to, to lead state building process, the risk you're talking about, the risk of losing the peace process, was not great for the public because the public believed Israel is anyway not negotiating and was running under fire. So why would Hamas be a bad choice under these conditions? Uh, the impact of Lebanon retreat. On the, uh, in July 2000, when, right after uh, Camp David, when we asked the public whether a return to whether, whether a violent confrontations would help Palestinians achieve national rights in ways that negotiations could not, we also asked that particular question. We asked, should Palestinians emulate Hezbollah? 63% said yes. That was July 2000. So the answer is yes. The Hezbollah model provided the Palestinians with something to look forward to now that negotiations have failed. So I must say that the failure of Camp David was critical in terms of changing public attitude regarding this issue. But I would say that perhaps this was important in helping to trigger the, the, the Intifada, but not to create public recognition of the utility of violence. There was still a great deal of distinction in the public mind between Lebanon and West Bank Gaza. It wasn't until Israel decided to pull out that I believe that that sort of rational utility for violence became deeply uh, uh, in, uh, ingrained in, in public uh, mind. Did, did Israel encourage Hamas victory? I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think that this was deliberate on the part of Israel, but the answer is absolutely yes, in the sense that the failure of the peace process to deliver, uh, as the public expected, end of occupation, certainly left Fatah empty-handed, had nothing to show for its own strategy. So the, the fact that the peace process was perceived as irrelevant on the day of election is certainly a failure 
uh, of failure of Fatah, but it was also a policy of Israel. Israel decided that it will not move forward under the Hudna or Tahdiya that Abu Mazen brought between March, mid-March 2005 until the day of elections, almost a year. There, were no, there was no progress in the peace process to convince the public. The only progress was in unilateral disengagement, which, as I said, went Hamas's way, not Abu Mazen's way, not Fatah's way. Well, the, the talk about deployment of inter first of all, I don't believe the international community wants to deploy in the Palestinian areas. So I, I don't think this is a likely scenario. Um, but I believe Palestinians will likely support such a scenario if it is meant to serve as a buffer along the lines of 1967, not inside West Bank Gaza. If what we're talking about is an international deployment inside West Bank Gaza, I do not believe there will be Palestinian public support for it. In any case, I, I, don't, I think this is a far-fetched scenario. I don't believe the international community would want to take any risks uh, that would involve deploying their own forces in the West Bank. I don't think it would be realistic to expect something like this. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Shkaki again for his uh, very enlightening presentation and his patient dealing with the questions, and thank you all and good evening.